and I'm going live here too. Okay, clicking go live. Do you see it on your end? I can't see anything from my end. It's fine. Okay, all right, all right, we are ready to go. Hey, everybody, welcome to the game of parenting and how to play it. So, my name is Fran. I am the author of a book called Can You Hear Me? which talks about my experience with uh, childhood trauma and its effects on my communication as an adult. And then Dima. <laughs> I'm the author of Intentional Reset, a book I wrote uh, because I wanted to provide <laughs> what I didn't have when I was hitting rock bottom. So um, shortly I hit rock bottom, I asked for help, it was always kind of a business related and there was no way out. Uh, I figured the way out and this is where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna write a book showing how I, I did it, but not from my personal experience, from the experience of so many people, along with the knowledge I have combining so many schools together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I came up with Intentional Reset to just give it to people whenever I meet someone who's stuck and say, try to use it. And we're here together to just try to um, have this conversation more often about how as parents, we are really affected by those stories that happened to us earlier in life. And that's how we met actually, sharing our stories together. And can you hear me? <laughs> I love, using, I love using the title of your book. <laughs> well, thank you for using it. <laughs> so um, earlier you mentioned that you wanted to talk about um, positive reinforcement versus punishment. Yes. And I think people view things, what positive reinforcement is and different versions of uh, punishment whether it be corporal punishment, taking things away. I'd love to hear what your version looked like or however you feel the flow is moving you, <laughs> go with it. <laughs> okay, so just to give you an idea why I, I suggested this title for our, our conversation today. Um, during the week, I get approached by so many parents, yeah, and normally working parents because they really want to stay working, but at the same time, they feel that they're losing control in their homes. And when, when people lose control, they really want to be back in control. And what happens here is okay. that they use so many ways and it's relative. It's um, every person finds it like some people find punishment, taking away stuff, um, maybe, uh, keeping kids at home, maybe shutting off the internet. Other people try to really be more open to understand the other, like the kid's point of view. So when I started getting this more often and I'm sitting there, like, you know, when a parent talk to you asking for help, yeah? And all they want is for you to give your program to, your, to their kids because for them, the kid is the problem, yeah? <laughs> and, and when you listen and they're telling you about all the different strategies they're using, I'm like, okay, how can I tell them that what they're doing is wrong without really being offensive? <laughs> so yeah, so, so and, and again, we're, we come from different cultures. So it's, it's just such a vast um, subject. I'm curious to know what kind of responses that you get from the parents. Like you said that when you do ask them these questions, you're on the line of wanting to not uh, offend them. What are some of those approaches that you have? Because that is, to me, I find that funny. And then also too, in another sense, I think it is something that is really important to keep in mind because one, you you know you have the answer and you want to give it to them, but you want to give it them in, in, in a way that they're, they're able to receive it. Yes, that's very true. And the first good thing about all of this is when someone approaches you as a coach, as a mentor, whatever your title is, 
means they can see something is wrong and they really need help with it. So you being there, you're not imposing because going back to when I started, so I'm an architect, yeah? And I was really good at architecture, on site, doing all the stuff. And then I started realizing how many people are really struggling with their lives. And I hit rock bottom. I couldn't find someone to help me. I tried to help people. I didn't try to help people. I started my Instagram page. People started relating to my stories. They asked me for help. Then I realized, oh my God, I'm helping them in just a chat. So when I was told that I need 12 sessions, there must be something I'm doing different than people are feeling relaxed, yeah? So mm -hmm. going through this and moving from being an architect to a mind architect, this is what the, the term I created for myself. Like it, it got me to, to really be in touch with people. But at the same time, when you're telling people about an advice, the first thing they look at you and like, yeah, but like you don't have, like you're not a psychologist, you're not a therapist, you're not, yeah. Like you're not qualified so, enough, right? Exactly. So, so this is the first thing I, I got. But then when, when people started asking me, I'm like, ah, so they must be seeing some value in what I'm doing. And then now I did the mental health certificate before I'm, doing, I'm studying psychology. But at the beginning, when people come to you, you know they're coming asking for help. Yeah? Yeah. Now, a parenthesis. I'm working with the Department of Education. And I did a presentation to explain to teachers because teachers are and parents, whether like this, we are, they're co parenting. The we are co parenting, and mm -hmm. our kids are spending seven hours a day with teachers. So they are the other parents, you know? And at some point, I got this thing like, I got this thing you're telling us that we are the problem. Mm. And with all what we're talking about now, it's not, we're not here to tell parents that you are the problem. We are here to tell everyone who deals with kids that they are the solution. Mm, I like that. So what was the feedback from the teachers? Because I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my presentation was all about social impact and how in our, like, think about your life, my life. We have the society, then we have the community, then we have the workplace, we have the family, then we have the individual. So the macro and then we go into the micro. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So the individual is really affected by the society and the society is affected by the individual. Yeah. And I go through my presentation to prove that even the school, like, because we have family, school, then workplace, university and workplace. I try to tell them that whatever is happening in our society, if we say 75% of people have gone through adverse childhood experiences, this applies to America, it applies to Australia, it applies everywhere. So it applies in the school in Australia. So most probably 75% of a class have gone through childhood experiences and the teachers, 75% of the teachers have, have also gone through this. So the teacher's feedback at the beginning was, oh my God, like, yeah, but we're like, what can we do? Mm. And I'm like, all we need to do as parents or teachers is to build connections. Is to build so connections? That's it. Building connections leads to healthy relationships, and we can mm. talk about this because this is based on, on research, by the way, and on how we can prevent those clashes because why do you want to control? Think about it as, as a parent or as a teacher. I want something to happen as per my expectation. Okay? Could you repeat that last part again? I want something to happen as per my expectation. I have a certain yes. expectation and from my point of view, this is the only way. Yeah? Yeah. And I'm coming to my child or to my student telling them that it's my way or the highway. <laughs> and okay. where is that leading to? <laughs> That's leading to a student. Now we have two types of students. Yeah? You mm -hmm. have the student that is compliant 
and you have the student who has his own opinion or her own opinion mm -hmm. which going back to percentages 14 percent of classrooms and of our society are either dominant has the dominant or the influencing character so this is and like we'll we'll move in a bit in all these details but just to, no, i to love it i'm listening i'm listening my ears are open so, in our society, we have different personality styles. I am a, a DISC certified trainer. Okay, DISC, which is from John Maxwell, he's in the US. Okay. So it's D for dominant, I for influencing, S for study, and C for compliance. Okay. Okay. Companion the D are, are sorry. Companion? Compl compliant for C. Compliant, okay. Now, the D is 3% in our society and applies everywhere around the world. I is 11%. C is, uh, sorry, S, S is 69. And D is 70. Could you go over those four again? Dominant? Yeah. Dominant, 3%. Influencing, 11%. Um, study, 69%. Study? C, compliant. Study. Study. 69%. 69%. And C, compliant, 17%. Compliant, 17%. Okay. Now, the dominant personality is the personality that likes the, like, is focused on the goals, doesn't track details. They just, they know what to, they know what to do. They know how to do it, but they're fast. They're fast moving. Yeah. Okay. They have a fear of, of being uh, rejected. Okay. Okay. And, the, the I are the ones, the influencing are the ones that are the heart of the group. They are the sociable ones. They are the ones that jump in and do all the plans. Like, let's go, let's do this, let's do that. They have a lot of friends around them. Okay. And they they like to, to, to shine and they don't like to be on the side. Gotcha. Okay. Now, the S is the study, the person who likes routine, who likes, he, they are conform, they like to follow instructions. The more instructions they have, it's better. They are people oriented. So they like teamwork. They are actually a good addition to any team. Okay. And, and the C, the compliant is the person who likes to follow the rules fully. Like if you come <laughs> and, and suggest something, they're going to stop you and say, this is against the law. This is, you can't do this. And then they give you a whole checklist of what's going on. <laughs> Okay, I so think I under the D, which one did you fall under? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a DI. I'm a DI, <laughs> and I'm a troublemaker. Whenever I go, I and and you know what? In the schools, I really connect more with the uh, with the students that are the troublemakers. Ah, that okay. everyone see as a problem. I see as they are the the really <laughs> the leaders. They are the leaders. <laughs> gotcha. And and you know what? The thing is that the nice part, the nice thing about personality style is in a team, we need the four personality styles because having my own business, I've been struggling because I need perseverance. I need structure. I need organization. That's why with my team, it's always better because someone can fill the gaps of my weaknesses. They're complementing okay? our, our weaknesses. Yes. Totally yes. Good. So if if we look at it this way, we have in as a parent, eighty six percent of us are gonna be compliant and steady because that's the, the the majority that like the rule that like to follow everything as it said. So when I was talking about expectation, as a parent who has let's say an S or a T, they're gonna be faced by by kids who might be a D and an, and an I. So go, going back to schools, a, a person who chooses to be a teacher is more a person who like, likes the routine. They don't want to go into adventures that are not calculated. So they're an, <laughs> they're an F or a C, okay. okay? So here, when you have a parent who's an S and a C and talking, and normally that's my conclusion, yeah? That normally the students that get in trouble are the ones that, they don't want to follow the rules. Now, I know we have rules and I know we need to respect them, but 
to connect with these children, you really need to go down to their level. And when we were younger, when like when our kids were younger, going down to their level, going down, like really on your knees and talking to them. But when you have teenagers, is connecting with them in a healthy way so they can hear you. Hear me. Can you hear me? Oh, really? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you about that earlier, like the connectivity. Like you earlier, you said we want to create these connections, um, but not just create the connections in a way that there could be dialogue that's created, right? Yes. Versus the connection of you have the a linear connection where there's only like a one way dialogue occurring yes and i know better than you and that's that's the thing now genuinely from the bottom of my heart as a parent i understand i'm i'm sure some people are listening to me now and they're saying but my child is dealing with drugs mm -hmm. my child is vaping my child would do might do things that might be risky for their lives, like driving a car fast. And we've heard so many heartbreaking stories about people like losing their lives just because they didn't calculate the risk. Yeah. So yeah. in this conversation, we, we are taking this into consideration because anything that is not normal as a behavior is usually a disconnect between the carer and the child when the child is not heard for such a long time with our busy schedules we develop that gap between us and them and they really don't want to listen to us so even if i really care from the bottom of my heart and i know my child is in danger imposing on them or punishing them is going to escalate this to the next level Mm -hmm. So it's training them not to leave the house. Okay, it works because for now they're under me. I can see them and they're not doing something wrong. But the minute they leave this door because they need to go out, they're going to do everything they want to do and they don't want to do just sometimes just to, to piss you off. <laughs> right, because they're looking for your attention, right? Yes, they're looking for your attention and they're not getting it in the good way because it's, it's or the disconnect is there. The only way they're getting it is through the negative behavior. Mm. If that makes sense. No, it makes total sense. Like whether the attention is positive or negative, they're obtaining your attention in some way, shape or form since asking you directly or asking the parent directly isn't working um and they're talking like in a civil manner something has to arouse you in order for you to really give them some att the attention that they need and since they can't get you while they're in a state of peace maybe chaos will create this attention that they need and i'll give you a proof to this story um, three years ago, I was still uh, in the Middle East working in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I connected with this family. I was helping the teenager girl to, to really believe in herself, develop self-confidence. I started working with the girl because I already solved the problem of the mother at, mm -hmm. at some point. Like, the problem was she was really uh, sick all the time, and she developed this... Uh, uh, complex from planes and every time she goes into a plane she vomits and so she went everywhere she tried to find a solution and the solution was only to look deeper why are you afraid and we we worked it on yeah okay when i started working with a girl i started because they open up yeah i started understanding from the girl what the mother was doing uh... okay and yeah, the mother insight as to why those behaviors were occurring. Oh, yes. that's And the mother was a perfectionist and she wanted her daughter to be perfect. Mm. And when her daughter failed in any exam, the girl the the mother would would be outraged and call the girl names and 
make her feel guilty and take away her makeup, like so many things, yeah? So the mom's inner critic sounds like it was the mom's inner critic and also maybe living vicariously through her daughter? Of course. Ooh. And you cannot help a teenager without helping the parents. However, at that point, um, the mother didn't like, thought she was okay. And I cannot come to someone and say, you're not okay. So in this case, I have to work, I have to work with the daughter. So going back to what will happen when they start asking for negative, for negative uh, uh, attention, mm -hmm. the girl developed panic, panic attacks every time she was coming towards the exam. But they didn't know, they didn't know it was a panic attack. The mother sent me a message saying, we went to the doctor, her heart is not, like there is a problem with her doc with her heart and all of that, like all what comes with it, yeah? Yeah. And and this is where I stopped and I'm like, oh my God. I said to her, I started opening up to the mother and said, listen, can we work together to try to get her to feel more comfortable about, about how she feels and about exams and about school and about all of this? Mm -hmm. Because I'm afraid if she gets this attention when she has the heart problem, soon she's gonna have frequent attacks. It right. might not be panic attacks, but she, her body is trying to ask for the attention. Right, right. So, so, and it happened again, but then I worked with her. I started working with the mother, trying to, to, to explain to the girl that your grades are not you. Like, it, it will, it's a long story, but at the end, we have to understand that our kids on a are on a learning path to be adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are two ways. There is either the, the positive reinforcement or the punishment in order to get them on the right path. Yeah. Yep. One of them, I would say, is, you know, pleasure seeking. Because when you punish, when you shout, you're getting this out of your way. And it's, it has a very short-term effect. Like a dopamine hit. Yeah, and, and this is the negative dopamine hit because wow. you want to release what's inside mm. without understanding that your child's language is different than yours mm. and it's negatively affecting them. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned about her having the anxiety attack. I wanted to also like ask you the feelings that she was expressing, right? Our body in certain ways are asking for an expression and those feelings can show up in different ways. So for her, it was anxiety. And so yes. like the interpretation of what, I guess, I think I heard the other day that our feelings are trying to interpret what we what the situation is and whatever that might come out to be in our body's expression which could be anxiety and other things is that kind of the the, the line of thinking here yes and they call it the abc model abc so model. you have yes so a is the adversity that comes our way that triggers whatever is going to happen okay. yeah suddenly we feel a feel so that's the C. This is the consequence of the adversity we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is one, the B is in between. It's the belief okay. that we have towards the adversity. Okay. So anxiety, smoking, drugs, all the outcomes, the consequences that are coming because nobody's listening to me actually are coming from a deeper level which is the b which is i'm not good enough mm. which is i've never been treated right and sometimes it's not really true because you're always treated good maybe that one time you haven't been treated right but kids without our guidance are going to de develop these beliefs and with time they're going to always go towards consequences that don't work for them Mm. Wow. And the solution here, the solution as per, that's what I'm studying, is to introduce a D. D is dispute the belief. 
So as an adult, let's say now, I have my child who comes and disrespects me. I lash out on him or her, get angry, and okay. start punishing, doing all the stuff. Now, what's the belief? The belief, I'm not a good parent. I know because when I was younger, I didn't feel good about myself. And we start going into a tunnel, a dark tunnel going from one idea to another. Okay. In this case, as a parent, in order for us to change the reaction we have, we need to change the belief. And that's where the D comes in. We need to dispute and say, no, 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 wait, wait. And we look at all the things we're doing well at work. We look at our connections. We look at the, all the blessings we have in our lives. Yeah? yeah. And with time, we start, when I have an adversity coming, I really breathe in. I take, I try to take control of the gap between what happened and my response to it. And mm. that's what we're talking about today is if I change that, if I take, I breathe in, I might be able to listen between the lines to hear my child saying what they really want to say rather than jumping to conclusion. So I, I had the situation where my mom, she is raising um, my stepbrothers and sisters and they're about 12, 12 years old. And then she was yelling at them and I was like, mom, how old are you? She was like, I'm 60 something. I said, do you think that yelling's working after all this time? And then I just sat there and I paused. And she was like, no. I said, so why are you doing the same thing over if it's not working? And then she goes, huh, right. I said, okay, well, what are some things that you can do different? And so I think having that conversation of awareness has brought her to think about it differently. I don't know if it's <laughs> been incorporated, but yes, this yes. that A, B, C, D that you were just referring to. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and, and it might not be incorporated immediately because it's like we learn to drive the car of our lives that way. Yeah, okay. it's a long, it, we've been practicing this habit for a very long yeah. time. So it's going to take as much time to unlearn that or practice. Right. Uh, yes, yes, take it this way. You, you drive automatic all your life. Yeah. And suddenly you have the, this beautiful car. You know, it's going to be amazing to drive it, but it's manual. Okay. So to move our system from not having a connection with our kids, from shouting, punishing, towards being calm, trying to understand, building a connection. At the beginning, it's going to be a very slow process, and we're not going to be the result immediately. But with training, with repeating, with repetition, and that's how our beliefs came, came to life. Mm -hmm. We repeated and repeated and repeated, and they became so much in, inside that now yeah. automatically we, we talk or we act. That makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. Yep. So I guess I, I guess hope the, someone is getting it. <laughs> yeah. I guess the question is, how do we identify? I guess when the when the environment in the house becomes tense or toxic, I guess that's the opportunity for us to check whether the belief systems or our parenting styles are applicable. Like, can we adjust this? Because like earlier today, I mentioned to you that I was watching uh, some sermon on TV and they were talking about parenting, like don't spoil the rod to spare the child. And so I said, the rod wouldn't, it, it may not necessarily mean a corporal punishment, like really spanking the child. It could mean like being firm with your child and whatever that, might be as far as you as a parent and you, um, I guess, executing that firmness with them. And so, but they still leaned on the side of spanking the child. And I'm like, I've seen for myself how corporal punishment has not been uh, conducive to my children being responsive to me. 
And so I was just saying firsthand, I don't necessarily agree with you, but if that's your point of view, that's your point of view. I'm not going to argue it. This is my point of view and this is my stance. And from my experience, this is what I think is the right application for me and my family. Yeah. I like depends on the culture. Like in Australia, it, like it could be a crime if you, if you even hit your child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in Lebanon, that's the way they use it. They use the wooden spoon. It mm -hmm. was like when you were probably like the wooden spoon is there. Yeah. For me, after really helping so many people out there, yeah, I came to a conclusion that is really, and I and you read it in a lot of in a lot of journals and articles, yeah. What do you want? So I'll give the I always like to give the extreme scenarios in a way. So I want my child to act in a good, proper way. Mm -hmm. because when I'm not there next to them, I want them to act in a good way in society. I want them to be good people in the society and in their works. I want them to succeed at, at their schools. I want them to choose the right partner. Yeah? Yeah. If, if we stop for a second and say, when I hit verbally or with my hand, when I do this part, Response. We we'll talk about. I'm gonna talk about being firm, but mm. first, being firm could be being really <laughs> tough with with them. Yeah, he's but confirming that that's what we should be talking about. <laughs> my, my daughter's just arrived outside, so he heard them. <laughs> so when I'm doing this, I say one 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 time. I like to give the example so people can understand it more. I had a close friend of mine who is a control freak. Mm. And she's like, you know what, Dima, I can't. I need to hit her so she understands. Like, I don't want her to have those, um, like, to do something wrong when she's older. And I looked at her. I said, I want to ask you one question. Mm. If, we, if we die by accident today, okay? What do we want our kids to have? Do we want them to have tools that, oh, when mom was here, I don't know, I'm not gonna say die, travel, had to leave for a job, like anything that you're not there for your kids, yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you want them to be standing there, worried, upset, lost, because they used to be guided by a spank? <laughs> so, when they move, ah, oh, I need a hit from here so I can take the right road. I've never been told what's the right road because my parents were busy, not me, like in general, kids don't learn how to deal with stuff because they are so controlled by their, by, by their parents. And I said to her, what we really need is to develop the critical thinking, to develop those ideas where they decide to do the right thing not because they're afraid of mom and dad but because they choose to do the right thing mm. so there is there's this difference between so we all want the same result but i either do it by developing by developing a certain communication with them and getting them to tell me because sometimes from a kid perspective, they got it in a way uh, because, an example, if I hit my child when he's two years old, he doesn't understand what a hit is. They understand that, oh, I'm in pain. That it hurts. Something wrong. Right. Yeah. So when they're older and I'm not there, all they know is I only act. I only know what to do when I'm, when I'm not feeling right. Right. So it's associated with like, okay, so that my parent hit me at two years old, but they care about me and they love me. So that could also be associated with that hitting as well. Yes. And yes. But <laughs> go, go ahead, Dima, talk about that because there's something else no, I want to touch it, on to. No, no, say it, say it. It's fine. Say it. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. 
Okay, okay. So I was thinking in a sense of like, I'm not, it's not sovereignty, but if God, right, and I'm not a a, a theologist, I'm yeah, just yeah. hearing some thoughts here. Yeah. People are, that verse that I mentioned earlier, it wasn't a verse that I mentioned, but it was part of a verse, yeah. how we yeah. spare the rod and spoil the child. Like, when I feel that if God is disciplining us, that he doesn't come down and hit us. There's no physical connection that he has with us to him. I feel like that he creates or he, she creates circumstances to where we can have an opportunity to reflect on the things that we've done if we take the time to look at the circumstance. Yes, and I'll, I'll add to you. We know, we learned, like depends on the culture, but in my culture is we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow? We reap what we sow. Okay. And we, we were given the opportunity to use our mind. And I, I think the word mind in the Bible is used, I don't know how many times, but it's used extensively. Okay. So we have the choice. And, and this is where I hit rock bottom, by the way. I was thinking, does God send the bad? That, that's, God, that's God, like, is he really in charge of the bad? Then it's catastrophe because now with all the wars in the world, like I would be really not wanting to 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 be talking to him anymore. <laughs> so so basically, I I that's my personal way of seeing spirituality and religion and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I think life is a journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Faith for faith for me is God being next to me, holding my hand and guiding, me. and that's what the parent should do. I like is that. he he doesn't jump in to stop you. He gave you the mind to use it and told you, you reap what you sow. He told you, you treat others like you want to be treated and not that mm -hmm. like they treat you. Yeah. So if we talk, we take these, these, uh, these two only, only, yeah? Life comes and hit me with something. Now, again, it's a way, it's a mindset. Life hits me because I didn't know better than this because my decisions are still young. Mm. And when life gives me that challenge, I develop my thinking, I develop my my strength in order to get over it. And once, I, once I'm over it, it's just like I feel much more powerful. And next time the same event happens, it's not anymore a problem. Because okay? you can respond better because you know better. Exactly. So, but God was always there next to us and he's guiding us through this connection of prayer and meditation. Now, some people think that sickness is a is a is a um, is a punishment. For me, I really think sickness, in most of the time, is us being so worried about that challenge we're facing. Even after we pass the challenge, we overthink about it over and over again. And we all know by now that when you are under stress, continuous stress, your cortisol levels are going up, your immunity are shutting. Right. So if you don't have immunity, then you're going to develop sickness. Is that a punishment? It's not a punishment. It's a result of how we are dealing with life. A response, right? Our... Yeah. So going back to, to the idea of parenting, yes, we are parents. We are in charge of our children, but our job is to guide them because if every time we step in and take them out of the challenge, fix it for them, put them back in, and that's spoiling, and I'm not in any way suggesting this. Or we're enabling um, it, right? Yes. Or if they are in the middle of the challenge, we hit them <laughs> to tell them they are wrong and they've done something wrong. They haven't learned from it. So in all cases, as a parent, if we really want our children to grow um in a healthy way to choose healthy partners, not to fail in their marriages. I think the best way to do it is first build connections and we can talk about how we can build connections because the minute my children, <laughs> the minute my children 
respect me the minute, even if they disagree with me. My kids don't agree with me on everything, but they have the opportunity to stand with me and say, listen, mom, I don't agree with your way. And I tell them, you have the choice to go that way or that way. Mm -hmm. This one has this consequence and this one has this consequence. If you choose the bad way, I never tell them, I'll, I'll not talk to you. I'll say, I'm, I'll be happy to support you to learn from it. Mm, that's good. Yeah, yeah, so. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, but they listen to me because I developed this relationship. And here, this week, I learned this. I learned about relationship. And I, I want to share with it with everyone today. We still have time. Do, do, we, do we have any questions or anything or we're fine? So we don't. Uh... I don't see anything on Instagram, on TikTok. Uh, let me see. If we do have something on Instagram, I can't see it. Nope. I just see people there. Okay. Perfect. LinkedIn, nope. So they can, whoever wants to ask any question or can relate to what we're talking about, all they need to do, put it in the question. And when I finish this, we can, we can talk about like we can answer whatever they have so in this so this week one of the things i learned and it was mind-blowing for me first is that the quality of our relationships in our life will predict our health in 75 years the quality of our relationship will res predict can you that again predict our health our health in uh, in 75 years wow so this is based on the first research i'm talking about is a research done uh, i think university of harvard mm -hmm. um it has been going for 75 years and during that time they got people from like there were two groups a group from harvard uh, they are harvard graduates and a group from those the poorest places in boston okay it started 75 years ago now they still have out of the 724 i guess people they still have um 60 people that they're still studying wow and during that all that time people divorced people they didn't know why they were going at the beginning who's gonna fail who's not gonna fail yeah but with time they realized money wasn't a predictor of good health and happy life wow. uh, they predicted uh, like even your your success in life is not predicting health the only one was the those who had healthy relationships with their partners with their families were wow. able to live longer and live happier i mean that makes sense because you have that support around you you have if it is a good relationship right yes and, and that's why if you look at communities so we have uh, we have the third world countries, and for me, they are the developed ones because they are collective communities. They care for each other. And you have where we live, we are individualistic communities where each person wants to, to make sure their future is good, then they're going to think about someone else. In a lot of places, people don't have connections with their neighbor, neighbors even. They don't have friends. So we must develop this in order to know that we're going to happy and as a parent going back to our subject so if we know that relationships are going to be are going to help us have a better future so why don't we invest our time in building healthy relationships mm. so in 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 our society we're here in Western society where we do, uh, I guess, what is that called? We, we really idealize individuality here. Yeah. How, I guess, how, how do we get to that place of garnering those types of relationships if this is the behavior that we've been practicing for a very long time? Imagine we, we've been raised from, like now, I came to Australia. I was in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in Le I was born in Australia, raised in Lebanon, and came back to Australia. Okay, and I think sometimes things have things happen for the good reasons because going into psychology now, I really want to learn more. What is this difference when 
In Australia, the suicide rate is 16%. In Lebanon, it's 2.4%. Where wow. in Lebanon, it's really harder to live. Like the basic needs are not there. Here you have all the basic needs, basic needs. So why people don't feel happy? So I've always had this, you know, this okay, dilemma, yeah. curiosity, yeah. like trying to understand. So we've been, we were here now, my kids, they see everyone working and they need money to, to survive. So they end up working during the week they're studying, on weekends they're working. So this is how the, the natural support goes because when you need your family, you need to work. So those Sundays where we used to spend together, those uh, evenings, like all of that, all of that is disappearing and we're replacing it with more work, more work, more money, more work, you know? And if you don't work, you're not gonna be able to have this, that, and the other. And that's how we are turning into people who want more. And then we have right. the first property. You see people depressed because they can't have the second property and the third property. Mm. So, so it's intentional, it sounds like. We need to be intentional about creating these relationships. Yes, because inten intentionality will will lead us to happier life. I'll give you a quick review about another study that showed happiness levels come 50% from our genes. So mm. we have a baseline of happiness. 10% of circumstances, money, success, uh, the people we are with. Yeah. 50% comes from our genes. Yeah. I need to get some more genes. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 listen to this. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> we, think, we think if we have the new car, if we have the new house, it's going to make us happy, right? That's mm -hmm. only 10% of our happiness. And the 40% is being intentional about the things we do. Wow. So to be happy, wow. to be, and we, I insist on talking about happiness here because as a parent, now we need to build healthy relationship. And this is the last part of our, our conversation. If I want to build a happy, uh, a healthy relationship with my kids, first, I need to be happy. I need to be in peace with myself. Okay, so I need to do intentional stuff. I need to work on my relationship with my partner or my husband or my wife or whoever, just to make sure that these kids are in the right environment. And if it is a toxic environment, I invite people to really take the decision to stop being in those toxic environments because it's it's not going to really help your kids just because you yeah. and your partner are together. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Now, how to build healthy relationships? There are three rules based on reason one know the love maps of the people around you, even your kids are the if love you, maps those yeah. are are they very similar to uh dr gary chapman's book the five love five love languages this is part of them so if you know what they like they if they're happier with a gift you don't go and hug them because i have one of my daughters that hates hugging yeah okay. If I come and hug her, I'm not giving her what she wants. So when I know what my kids love, if I know my, my daughter doesn't like this food and I want to surprise her and I, I cook for her what she doesn't like. Those mm -hmm. are simple examples, yeah? yeah? But when I know the love language of my partner of my, or of my kids, because relationships are all, any, any type of relationship, I will be able to really be more compassionate to that person. Mm. That's one. Okay. Two, fondness and ad admiration. So how many of us focus on what's wrong with their kids or with their partners rather than saying thank you when they do something, appreciating the strengths they have? Mm, I've done it before. <laughs> oh, we, we've all done yeah. it before. Yeah, 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 both extremes. And and now, whoever is listening to us, if they close their eyes and they think in one day, if they focus on the good or if they focus on the bad more, we're going to see a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, but there are things that need to be that way. No, we all have weaknesses and we all have strength. Positive reinforcement is about looking at the strength in people, is looking at what they do right 
And the more you encourage them, they're going to go away from what they're doing wrong. Mm. And the Makes third sense. one is turning towards, not turning away. So what do I mean by this? A lot mm. of times our kids come to talk to us and we're so busy with our work that your daughter or your son would be coming to you, Mom, I did this, I did so well in this. Look at that, look at this. And we're like, I'm just, we're like, ah, oh, yeah. And we turn back. Oh, we yeah, don't tell. <laughs> wow. So if we turn away, when we ask them or when we give them an advice, they're going to come and not listen to us. They're going to they're gonna go against us. The yeah. conflict is going to become harder and this is where everything escalates and we feel the 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 urge to control and impose on our children not giving them the chance to learn mm. so the the basic three things again if you can repeat them for our our audience know the love map of the other person no, or the, the, the kid mm -hmm. appreciate and show fondness toward the other people. Okay. And the third one is turn towards them, not away from them. Give yeah. them time. Give them time so they can share with you. Because a lot of times it could be, look, mom, the weather is nice. And all they want is to grab your attention so they can have a, a longer conversation. Yeah. Um, I think one of the ways that... I have implemented it, but I've, I've shifted away a little bit from it. Um, is like I have this little table that me and my daughter sit on, and it's yeah. a small Japanese table. So we're on the floor, and like while we're eating, we put away our electronics so that way yeah. we can have this dialogue. I remember one day I'm putting my thing on because I'm listening to some podcasts, and she's like, What are you doing? And I'm like, Oh, so I put it away, and I was just like, so how was your day? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I thank you for that because that was already a rule that we established. So like, it's that quality time, right? It's not just addressing them in a instantaneous manner or just a passive mm -hmm. manner, being yeah. really fully present with them. True. And the last thing I would like to share concerning this same research and I really memorized it because I love the outcome, is they also say, what are the four things they pre that predict uh, divorce, separation, um, disconnect with our children and our partners? And this is where you're like, I was like, oh my God. Like sometimes we really do things thinking it's like constructive criticism. Mm. Criticism is criticism. So the four things that really stand in the way of our relationship with our kids, criticism, yeah. focusing on what's going wrong and not mm. what's going right. Okay. The second one is defensiveness. So they come to tell me, even if they have a comment I don't like, oh, no, I didn't do this. Be calm try to understand their point of view because if you're defensive that's the last time you're going to hear from them mm. the third one which is the ultimate it's disrespect and discontent showing them that they're nothing mm. i know better like the way you talk to your children and sometimes without noticing we call them names we we say stuff just in despair of the moment but it has a damage forever Mm. And the fourth one is stonewalling, where we get upset and we ignore the people around them, around us, like, like uh, what do you call it, silent uh, treatment? Yes. Or yeah. So these four things, if we are doing them with our children, we have to understand that there's, there's no way we're gonna build connection. And even if I do punishment, even if I, so, when you were talking about. So how can we how can we um, raise them if we don't tell them what's wrong? Right. It we need to tell them what's wrong. We need to be firm. 
I but was saying I that. Have, yeah, we cannot I be firm. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that to um, one of my cousins one time. Um, they didn't want to, they had this role where they didn't want the kids to be around when they were arguing. And I asked them the question, like, how are they supposed to learn how to know how to handle conflict if they're in the room? Like, wouldn't it be better for them to know what kind of dialogue to have or what some of these situations would look like? Uh, what, because I feel like the modeling that they're seeing, if it is a good one or a healthy one, would yeah. also benefit them when they get into situations, whether or not it's a, a, a romantic relationship, just life in general, they know how to have this kind of dialogue. Yeah, like in a way, if because the minute we say they're arguing, mm -hmm. means there is a kind of disrespect and I wouldn't want the kids to be exposed to that. But if I, if we have different opinions and we know how to deal with the conflict, Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it, it depends, but a lot of times in the modern days, it escalates from zero to 100 in one go. So mm -hmm. all what we're trying to say is, yes, we want them to, to see what's happening. We want to be firm. We want to, to, we want them to learn that they're doing mistakes. But again, I go back to the same thing. If you don't have a connection with your kids, no matter, even if you talk, 24 7 to them about what they shouldn't do the minute you're talking their ears are blocked they're not with you just because there is no connection yes. however if you develop a connection and if you tell them like i tell my kids try not to say i know to other people like when someone is trying to teach you something mm. i know i know i know i'm like take whatever you want from the conversation like let's say you're talking to your grandma or your grandpa and the grandpa and grandma come and tell you something. Sometimes it's too much. I'm like, just listen, take what you want and just give them that pleasure that you're listening to them. Mm. You see, mm. but you yeah. cannot communicate this if every time they talk to you, you're defensive, you're criticizing them and there's no connection between Yeah, I think uh, one of the things for me with connection was like, I didn't have a connection with my children because they didn't trust me because of the um, promises that I broke to them. When I broke those promises, uh, whether they were verbally, or well, that's what, how I made them, right? When I broke those verbal <laughs> promises, um, that established to them that I wasn't trustworthy that established to them that they can't come to me um, or because I'm not reliable. So I had to work on those things for myself in order to create a connection of trust with them. So once I identified through circumstance <laughs> that I was not keeping my promise, I then had to be intentional, intentional intentional about what I was saying and make sure that I delivered on my verbal promises. And then also to become that safe space for them. Like you said, if I'm not modeling what I'm saying, like, like you said earlier, you can say whatever it is, what you want to your face turns blue. They're not going to listen to you because your words and your actions do not match up with what you're saying. So they want somebody that they can trust so that way they can feel like you, oh, okay, well, mom and dad really do know what they're talking about because I see that they're doing what they're saying. Yes, and it's never too late to change. So if someone mm -hmm. is listening to us today and they really feel that maybe they're doing it wrong, don't worry about it. Because even today, if you start doing something else in a different way, trust me, it's going to change and the kids are going to feel that, oh, there is a change. Now, don't be impatient. Again, we talked about driving. Yeah. It takes time because they're going to test you. And okay. life is going to test you to see if you will react in a negative way. So do we want to punish? I think in our parenting styles, as a conclusion, 
I encourage whoever is listening to this to take the decision today and not tomorrow to mm. stop to stop that toxicity because punishment comes with toxicity and try to be more compassionate first with yourself because the problem is always starts from within. So if we're okay. too harsh on ourselves, we will be too harsh on everyone around us. We got to talk about that in the next one, Dima, self-compassion, because- yeah. oh, Okay, so yeah. that's gonna be, that's it. <laughs> next week, yes. it's all about how we can be compassionate and what does it mean right. to be compassionate. <laughs> totally. Well, everyone, um, if you are on social media land and you have a question, I don't have, um, I guess immediate access to it, but you guys can also leave a comment afterwards and we'll try to answer you via uh, online. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and for those of you that might wanna find Dima or I, we're all on social media, but Dima, is there a specific place that they can find you that you no. like reach out to you? It's Dima Istanbuli. It could be Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok even. It could be Dima Istanbuli or Mind Architecture because I, I operate normally under those two names. All right. Well, everybody, she is the author of Intentional Reset. If you see me, you'll find her somewhere inside of my feed. And um, yeah, so grateful for you guys joining us. Once again, we're doing this 10 parent, uh, this 10 part parenting series called The Game of Parenting and How to Play It. So we have nine more left. So be intentional about intentional about intentional <laughs> about coming in and just sharing space with us because we're not trying to sell anything we just want you to empower yourself as parents to become a better version of yourself for the ones that you love the most which are your children and thank you so much friend for having me because you are the the founder of this idea <laughs> <laughs> We're going to call it that, Dima. All right. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. I'm going to.